Minuso, about 20 years ago, I took a, a, the, my first Iyengar intensive with you. And it was a moment that I still remember thinking, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, so thank you for that. How, what was your aha moment with Mr. Iyengar? I had several, but um, the first one was my first meeting with him. I had studied out of his book for more than two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know he was alive at the time, but then eventually word got out that he was coming to Northern California where I was living. And uh, I did everything I could to try to find him and to, or try to get into those classes that he was going to be giving. Uh, they only gave me an observer spot and they let me take one class with him in the evening, but I got to watch him teach 60 people in Berkeley, California that year, 1976, May. I had never seen anything like it in my life. He took a two hour, what was supposed to be a two hour class, it went for four and a half hours. I had never seen a master of any kind do what he did in that way. I knew from that moment on, my life was different. After that week, I sold everything I owned, put the rest of it into storage and moved, went to India seven months later and put myself under his Guide, guidance and care. And you were married at the time? No, uh, I was eventually, excuse me, my future wife traveled with me. We came home and got married. But so yes, she's we, also at oh yes, right along that same path. She watched Iyengar that same week and also became inspired by, by this master who could change people's lives the way that he did over and over again. So now that he's not here to do that, um, you're one of those people? Yes, but nobody does it as well as he have it, he was w capable of doing. You understand he can even influence people though he's not present. His books still speak, his lectures are still available. There, 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 there are all kinds of ways that one can still be, find this master of what he did and let them inspire their lives. You know, it, it's, it would be really easy for this to slip into some sort of a cult mentality. But I want to tell people what I've been telling them for years. This is the most human human I've ever run into. He lived life to the maximum and fullness that the rest of us aspire to. And this was part of what his message was, that this path of yoga can bring one to a state of awareness in a way that almost nothing else can. And that when you bring yourself into that state of understanding, and, and touch the lives the way he touched mine, the way yoga touched his, many of us can find that inspiration, whether he's actually present with us or just his inspiration through others or through his books or his writings, through his films, etc. What do you do if you have a question, though? There's all kinds of questions. Your answers only come from within. I mean, everybody's looking for an outside source to solve everything for us. He never laid it out quite in that way. It wasn't that he wasn't a master, and yes, I can help you with your shoulder here, and, but the, the real work of this is the practice, and he never varied from that. Mm -hmm. It was like, come on, you have to participate. Come on, you have to become involved. Don't look for somebody from the outside to start answering all of these questions. But in the beginning, you asked a lot of questions. You, I was all questions. <laughs> I was so foolish. I was, uh, everything was like, like, oh, this is confusing. I can't see what you're talking about, sir. This doesn't make any sense. But slowly, slowly, he took me along by the hand and guided me from point A to point B until now I understand a little bit about the subject. Well, you, you've been with him for a very long time, yeah. and I know that you've quoted him as saying, and I've heard him saying that when he looks at light on yoga, he says, that man was a fool. Yeah, yeah, sometimes. Can you tell us what he means about that? He means that sometimes he had learned more than he would had knew at the time that he published the book. Mm -hmm. So if he says that the pose looked like this, or that I worded it this way, maybe that was correct for what my understanding was at the time. But he was always in a process of learning. He never stopped. He never said this is a fixed canon. It's a beginning point. So when you look at Light on Yoga, learn what he had through there, and then see if you can go to the next generation. He kept looking. He was still developing yoga in his 95th year telling people to change what they had done, even stuff that he had told them 20 years before. Don't do it this way. Try it this way now. See how it works for you. Develop these new set of answers. And what was that evolution in the 40 years that you've been studying with him? How has it changed? How has it evolved? Well, I don't know that anybody can ever really answer that. I mean, you're asking me to codify this, this, this huge canon of understanding. He said himself, in his early years, he had no interest in the timepiece. 
In other words, a stopwatch, as we call it, where we hold poses for timings. In the early years, he was interested in doing the poses. Then he said he could feel them more and dive a little deeper if he held them a little longer. Mm -hmm. And you'll see there's poses in Light on Yoga that he says, hold for as long as you can, the breath will be short and fast. Those same poses, I watched him 20, 30 years after Light on Yoga was, was published. He's holding those same poses half an hour, 35 minutes, calmly, you know, Kapotasana was like that. He leans over backwards, grabs his own ankles, drops his elbows to the floor, stays there half an hour. Light on yoga, he tells you, you'll be lucky if you can hang out a minute. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But he says you're lucky if you can do that pose because it's that difficult. Now, talk about development. That's his own personal development. And once you understand that, how can you teach like you did before? That's the fool that he's talking about. Now I know more. Now look at it this way. Don't look at it that way. Change your perspective today. Find a new way to look. So you got to also see him change yes. the way he was teaching. Yes. And he'd come in and he'd say, okay, throw away what I gave you last time. Now do it again this other way. Did he change his way of teaching beginners? No. He never changed his way of teaching. Mm -hmm. He changed his methodology sometimes within the confines of one post. But the method itself really never changed. And that was pay attention. Look again. This is a yoga. This is not a physical exercise. Don't confuse it with anything like contortions. Know inside that the mind-body experience brings you to this moment. And that if you do it by rote, if you do it just by repetition from what you did yesterday, you're not, not just not making progress, you're not even doing yoga. Mm. You're just punching your body through it. He had no interest in that, ever. That he always is, is, is looking for that next generation. That huh. makes me feel good because I can't do Kaputasana. <laughs> Tomorrow may be your day. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Um, what are the challenges of teaching beginners when you're um, in, 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 this, in this system? The challenge is like it is for everything else. You have to understand they don't know their body in any sense. And it's frightening to begin with. It's quite foreign. The words that are used are not familiar to those people. The action to the body, they spend a great deal of time trying to protect themselves. We start many of our beginning level uh, uh, classes with standing poses, which means that there's a certain fight that one has to do just to maintain their balance from falling over, or etc. So they spend so much time tightening to protect, there's not a lot of action or movement or release that takes place inside. And then the other thing that happens is, is when people walk into a classroom situation, they're staring all over the place. Oh, that woman is flexible. This fellow over here is very strong. Then they start comparing themselves with everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. And this is always, of course, the worst thing you could do. Mm -hmm. Because what you're really supposed to be doing is, is working on yourself. Not working on yourself compared to this person, that person, etc., and so forth. So it's disconcerting for them. So you walk them along. You let them start to understand that there's going to be a certain amount of disconcert here and that you ask them to see, can you go a little further? Can, you, can I coax you a little bit more? Stay with can me. you always stay with me? <laughs> Wake up, stay here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's the challenge of teaching intermediate students? Well, intermediate students already have a fixed position in their brain as to what they think they can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. And so you have to break that down. I mean, I make the statement oftentimes in intermediate classes, all of you have tried every pose in light on yoga. And you've already either decided how you're going to do it that you can accomplish it, or you, can't do you it. decided that you can't do it, or you've decided that you require this prop and this prop, and you have to actually break that down to allow them to come to that next generation, to allow them to, 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 to find their way in a little deeper. Yeah. Well, since I, studied, uh, I started studying with you, I have something hasn't changed. People lining up to you mm. in, the, in the beginning of the class sure. to tell you all their ailments. Sure. And you know, not that I'm any better than anybody else, but I actually, the work that you gave me 20 years ago, I've been doing it. Sure. My back is better, my knees are better, you fixed all my injuries, you know, and you fixed my broken tailbone and everything. And why do they still line up to you? Well, first of all, some of them have never studied with me before. No, but I see some of the same people. Yes, of course <laughs> they do. Second of all, you know, I have a, a reputation that says that I can do some therapeutics, that, some, that I have some understanding that can help some people that can't get help other places. But a lot of them have injured themselves so badly that they're, they're continuing to work on it or they've given up working on it until I get back into town. And some of them are actually telling me that they're not willing to do much of anything 
because I, they still have that injury. Mm. There's all kinds of psychologies that go. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've, I've made the same kind of comment because it, it really did happen to me. I had somebody come to me and say, I've got a problem with my knee. They leave, the next person after them uses the exact same words. I have a problem with my knee. Now the first person is asking me for help. The second person is saying, I don't care what you do in here, don't touch my knee. And they're both in some ways wrong. Mm -hmm. The one who's asking for help, I do appreciate that. Now the question is, have you helped yourself to get to here? And then the, the other one is completely wrong being, why are you in a yoga class unless you're really asking for help? Mm -hmm. You know, and so you have to come to the point of educating them that yoga can help, that they've got to still look for the possibility of it getting better. Not necessarily like it, like you were born. If it's ruined that bad, but imagine coming from a severe injury, your knee, your shoulder, your back, and being able to get full range of motion again with very little or no pain, well, that's a huge improvement. Well, at least having a life without having a pain. Life. Having a life without pain. Um, it, it, I think it's, it's a very interesting thing how last night you said something about and I'm not going to quote you because I don't do that. Um, but you said, you talked about us really taking responsibility yeah. and doing the work. And um, it's been my experience that with the tools that you gave me, I kind of ran with it and I played around with it. And, and it helped me to the point where I can be, of course, there's always more to learn. Absolutely. But at least I'm not having that same issue that's creeping up on me and bothering me and taking away from my, my real life. So. Um, well, it also becomes interesting because, to follow up on your last question, when you start to take responsibility for yourself, it becomes infectious and magnetic. And then other people, at first, want you to take responsibility for them. Mm fix my knee, mm -hmm. help my shoulder. And then if you turn it back on them going, okay, this doesn't work like Western medicine. You don't walk in and tell the doctor, do whatever you want, doc. It's like, okay, I've got to be responsible for my own self now. My own body, my own knee, my own injury, my own healing. And once you start to make those kinds of transitions and do take those responsibilities, all of a sudden your whole perspective on everything changes. Mm -hmm. And when somebody becomes a yoga teacher, then all of a sudden you now have to shoulder more. They, have, they expect more of you and you have to teach them how to become responsible like you've become. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that that's already what's going on. <laughs> so this taking responsibility for yourself is really the complete opposite of what the medical community really wants. Well, I, I'm not downgrading the medical community. I absolutely, I'm mm -hmm. one of those people that believes in Western medicine, mm -hmm. but having said that, what I am is a yoga practitioner, and when I try to get people to become yoga practitioners, I'm asking them to do the same thing that Patanjali said 2,000 years ago, and that is, is you now have to live with a sense of understanding of where you are, who you are, what you're doing, and once you start that responsibility, once you take on that seeking, now all of a sudden the entire universe changes. Now there's nobody to blame for me being this or me being that or me being this. The world, all right, it dealt me whatever I have. Now, what's the next generation? What can I do with this that has been given to me? What can I do with this that's been taken away from me? What am I willing to do to make the transition into there? And that's what Iyengar Yoga is. That's what Patanjali's Yoga is. Iyengar really was not off base, even though he revolutionized the subject. He was always seeking backwards to the understanding that comes out of those sutras. The pains that are to come can be and are to be avoided. Uh, yeah, are to be avoided, exactly. And the samskaras that bring the rise to thoughts can be downplayed until, and space created between until you get to the point where they become burnt seeds. Because I could spend all of my time with my covers over my head, I'm depressed, I have this, I don't want to get that, I, you know, this person's been lucky, I have never been lucky, I want to win the lottery, I want to be born this way. Forget it. This is who you are, this is where you are. Figure that part out, then decide how you're going to proceed. Accept it and do what you can to get rid of your pains. Right. Knowing full well that the, the Buddha was right, life is suffering. Now, what am I going to do with that? Right? Knowing that that is in fact acceptable and that I understand that, that, that concept. Yeah.
because nobody's got a, 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 a monopoly on the truth. You know, I'm not a Buddhist, but I do understand that concept and some of the others, knowing full well that he was right. If you start with the understanding that there is this great anguish and suffering in the world, and then look to see what you can do, knowing full well that that's always in the background, moving onward with that. The, 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 even Patanjali has a very, very similar outlook, knowing full well that the Buddha studied yoga. Just be, being in a human body Positively. is already telling you that no you're going to suffer. Yep. And you're gonna people are going to die around you. You're going to, old, you're going to decay. The people around you are going to decay. There's going to be calamities you're, you're going to see with tremendous amount of uh, 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 over your lifetime. Now, what are you going to do about it? Where, what outlook are you going to have? Not this kind of new age, half empty, half full glass, but real responsibility, not I feel for that person. What can I do for them? Let's get up, let's get moving. <laughs> in this suffering body, um, Mr. Angar would always go back to the soul, in yep. the seat of the soul. And mm -hmm. So can you tell a little bit about that? How it is the soul yeah, in this remember, sorrowful... I'm not, I'm not a particularly religious man, so mm -hmm. I'm not going to do a lot of things about that. But I get glimpses of the reality of the way Manuso sits in the universe. I'm not pretending for a moment to become enlightened, that I've become enlightened. What I'm trying to do is saying I get little glimpses of clarity to start to see. Mm -hmm. now, now, Patanjali says there are many ways towards enlightenment. And he said that the easiest way is giving everything up to God. But because I don't necessarily buy into that entire kind of understanding, th th nobody's to ever worry about that. You, you figure your, your, your understanding out about this. When you start to see that that might be the easiest way, then that could be the path that you choose. But I was trained in the sciences in my youth, and you know they wanted me to become a priest, and I rejected that. I had no interest in it. <laughs> yes, yes, in the Greek Orthodox Church. Really? Yes, yes, yes. But, but th th all that put aside, becoming a questioner was actually part of the path of yoga for me. Mm -hmm. So so saying, you know, that Ishwara that you that, that Patanjali talks about is one way to go. And Anger was right on board with that. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be on board with that to understand a little bit about yoga or to even understand a little bit about Anger, knowing full well that I had no interest in Hinduism or Buddhism or, or any of the others. But I'm trying to figure out that I and this universe are in fact here at the same time, that I'm part of it, not separated from it, and then I can move forward from there, perhaps. That soul that they're talking about is, in fact, that understanding, where you get that line between Purusha, Prakriti, where they talk about there is the nominal world, and then there's this witness, there's this, this consciousness that witnesses, sees what goes on in the world. They say that no matter what you do, you have to stay part of this world, proper nouns, who you are. And they say, but you can get closer and closer to that witness until, of course, you pass on. That's why the last, when they, when in, in India, one of the ways they talk about somebody dying, they say Mahasamadhi, the great undertaking, mm. that that freedom begins to come. Because they say, no matter what you do, you have to stay on this side, you're still part of the universe. And then eventually you might cross over into pure consciousness that looks at the universe. Well, that's the, that's the theory. But you have to understand, I haven't become enlightened and I haven't made the crossover to start to see it from that, from that witness. I just have to take that from the understandings of the ancient ones and the people who have come before me. So. Thank you for taking away my soul. <laughs> yeah. you Thank you. He can even influence people, though he's not present. His books still speak, his lectures are still available. There, 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 there are all kinds of ways that one can still be, find this master of what he did and let them inspire their lives. You, you know, it, it's, it would be really easy for this to slip into some sort of a cult mentality. But I want to tell people what I've been telling them for years. This is the most human human I've ever run into. He lived life to the maximum and fullness that the rest of us aspire to. And this was part of what his message was, that this path of yoga can bring one to a state of awareness in a way that almost nothing else can. And that when you bring yourself into that state of understanding and, and touch the lives the way he touched mine, the way yoga touched his, many of us can find that inspiration whether he's actually present with us or just his inspiration through others or through his books or his writings through his films etc